Hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you as ever from Vitality Stadium. Our job here is to bring you closer to some of those personalities collected to the club throughout the course of the season, be it first team players, staff, management or academy personnel. Now, for those of you who are new here, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. Today, I'm once again privileged to be in the company of Neil Perrett, a fountain of AFC Bournemouth knowledge and someone that has been following the fortunes of the club for the last 30 years. Neil, it's great to be back. Can I start by wishing you a very happy new season? Thank you very much, Zoe. Happy new season to you. Can't wait now. First game on the horizon. Few new signings in the door already. Really looking forward to see how things are going to go. Obviously got a new head coach as well. So uh, can't wait. Well, we've got quite possibly our most exciting guest yet. Someone that's new to England and new to the Cherries, but has an incredibly impressive CV. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Andoni Iraola on our official club podcast. Andoni, thank you so much for your time and for joining us. First things first, how are you? Hi, thank you, Zoe. Uh, I'm good, I'm good. I'm uh, looking forward to start the season because uh, it's really close. We've been preparing this pre-season to be in our best moment uh, for the game against West Ham and we'll see it uh, very soon. How have you settled in, obviously, both here at Vitality Stadium and away from the football? I think everything has been... uh, you have been quite helpful, I would say. Uh, things have been really easy uh, in in the pitch outside the football, because I I started living in a hotel. Now already have a a house, already have a car, so I can I can win some independence and I can explore my my own do my own research and and explore some places. And only you said you'd already been to. Durdle door to have a look round. Is there anywhere else that you're particularly looking to go to? Yes, I've been also walking through the um, uh, old Harvey Rocks area. Yeah, until Swanage. Uh, I, I love, I love the, the the places. I love to walk. Uh, I think it's uh, a really lovely area. I have also some 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 recommendations to go to Christchurch, also to some beautiful places where where we can have a walk also and okay, have things to do. I can truly recommend Highcliffe, Andoni, because that's where I live and it's next door to Christchurch. So you're more than welcome to come round for a cup of tea one day. I appreciate it. Now, you've kept your family life very private. Um, are we allowed to know how your wife and children are settling in as well? Yes, I'm waiting. I am still waiting for them. I think probably this week or next week they will be able to come because these visa issues it take time, and they are waiting for 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 the visa to be everything solved so they can they can fly here. Uh, but yes, yes, uh, we already done our homework with the schools with this stuff, and uh, I have my wife and two children. My daughter is eight. My son is three. And uh, I'm sure they will suffer at the beginning with the language and all these things. But I think it's going to be a very good experience for them. How, how, how did your wife uh, take to the fact that you were all going to be moving over to England? She's used. She's used because at the end, uh, with our job, you have to be ready all the time. Even from my, my, my football career, let's say, uh, even if I, it was almost in the same place, but we have to be ready. You never know when you are going to have to move. And she's used, she's really happy to come here. I think it's, uh, I've, I've told her, it's, uh, we've been lucky with the area, with the city, with the people living here. And I'm sure they will all enjoy it. Now we're going to go right back to the very start for you. Just tell us a little bit about your childhood and, and your upbringing. Well, I think quite normal. Quite normal. I, I I was raised in the Basque Country in San Sebastian, in actually in a in a town outside San Sebastian in Surville. It's a small town, and uh, something pretty normal. I used to play football, but I actually didn't realize that I had a chance to become a football player until quite late. I would say until I I started playing for athletic youth teams, the academy, but I was already 16, I think, 16 years old, something like this. So everything until the 16 years old period was not so football related. 
So when you were younger, did you did you follow football? Did you watch football? Because, you know, some players here, they say, oh, I grew up and I was football mad. Football was everything. How was that for you? Uh, I love all the sports. I love all the sports. Even here that I didn't know cricket, I've, I've been watching, I've been learning with the Aces, you know, with this... These, these games and I love all the sports. I, I love, uh, I, I like football, but I love also, I don't know, I love cycling, I love a lot of sports, different sports. And I used to watch a lot, uh, watch a lot when I was younger. Did you have a favorite team or a favorite player or anything? I remember in my moment, the, probably the, the, the player I kind of idolized was Michael Laudrup, Danish player. He played for Barca, for Real Madrid later, Juventus previously. Probably was the only player I could say, okay, I was always looking at him and trying to learn things from him. But it's the, the only thing I ever remember. Now, obviously, we know that Justin Clivert's dad and grandfather were footballers as well. What about you? Are you from a footballing family? No, 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 no. My, my father is the only one that likes to watch games. Uh, my mother, even my wife. My wife normally doesn't even watch our games. <laughs> normally, he, she asks me, "Okay, you won. You, you, you are going to be happy." But she, she doesn't understand the game. She, she is normally uh, not talking too much about football. That I think is a very good thing for me. Now, I understand that you gave up a law degree to pursue a career in football. Just tell us about that that decision. No, I wouldn't say exactly like this. I started playing football and uh, for the moment I had to decide that I, I was going to the university. I was already kind of very close to the first team. So I had to decide to go for a career where I could pass the exams. I could do something without going to class because I had already the the trainings, the professional trainings in the morning, even double sessions. So I went to classes just twice a week, probably. And I, I managed to go until I, I think it was kind of more than half of the career. But I haven't finished it. I haven't finished it. So what do you think you'd be doing now if you hadn't made it as a f footballer? I really don't know because I really uh, don't really like the, the law, these, th these things. It was OK. I was quite good in the in my studies you know so okay you need to go to university to do something but i don't think i i would follow this this route uh, i don't know i something else i don't know oh, i read somewhere that you once fancied opening a bookshop is that true yeah <laughs> yes we talk a lot about this eh? probably now is not the best period to to open a bookshop because uh, almost all the people I read in with the ebooks and all these things that I really like to, to, to read. I, I really like to be involved with this, this kind to, to go to a bookshop to spend 30, 40 minutes looking for, for new books, new, new chances. And I've always uh, talked about these things, yes. Now, you started in the youth ranks at Antioch, an amateur club near your hometown. Just tell us about that club and, and some of the players that you came across there. Yes, it was. It has been strange because in that moment it, it was not kind of famous, but they have become famous. They don't have a first team. Let's say they only have under 18s. So we were playing there, not with the with the hopes of becoming really professional football players because okay, enjoying with the friends and actually we we finished having a really good team. We had very good results and in our uh, later years there, a lot of players who were playing together there. We finished in, in the best academies there in, in the Basque Country and, and even in, in other areas of, of Spain. And, and some of them, I would say a lot of them, we've, we've become football players. Now, you then moved to Athletic Bilbao. You spent 15 years there. In your four seasons as captain, the club reached two Copa del Rey finals a Europa League final and qualified for the Champions League. You must look back at that time as some, some really fond memories. Yes, of course. It has been my, my club. Forever will be my club. I think I've spent uh, almost half of my life there. In the academy, in the first team, uh, I've played, I think, one more final that you said about Copa del Rey. I lost them all. I've lost them all. I, <laughs> I've lost all the finals I've played because Europa League final we lost, the three Copa del Rey finals, the Super Cup we lost. But we were there. We were almost, we played for the Champions League, a lot of uh, games also in Europa League. 
and uh, probably the 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 thing that uh, it's not completely full about my career is I couldn't win a trophy with them. I played a lot of finals, we did very good things, we played in Europe, successful career I would say, but we didn't at the end uh, win any any final and that's probably the only thing I would change of, of my football career. Now you rarely missed a game, you know, over the spell that you were there. Would you have considered yourself to sort of be fortunate with injuries and, and things like that? Yes, I've been fortunate. I've been fortunate. Uh, I wasn't really to to for being a right back. I wasn't very very explosive. I wasn't super fast. I was. I could maintain. I could go uh, up and down all the game, but I wasn't so explosive. So probably that's one of the reasons. Probably the the players that are faster, they have more risk of muscle injuries, and uh, I've been quite quite lucky. Uh, this has allowed me to play a lot of of games during my 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 career, and probably at the end of my career is when I started feeling okay. No, it's not the same now. You start feeling the soft issues, but uh, you you start feeling the the games you've already played. Now you played under no no fewer than seven different coaches as well. Now I know that's part and parcel of football. What what was that like for a player? Uh, I think in that moment, probably you are not thinking, uh, for sure I was not thinking in my coaching career. When you are playing, I don't think there are a lot of players that think that they will continue as coaches. But I've been quite lucky with coaches I've had, uh, really good ones. Probably the the one who influenced me more was Ernesto Valverde, because I had him in the youth teams, in the second team. Uh, he was the one who gave me the chance to become a, a pro football player, to make me, my debut in first division and I also had him at the end of my career and uh, he has been very important for me and I also had uh, you know Marcelo Bielsa, uh, Vicente del Bosque with the national team, uh, very 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 good uh, coaches overall. Is it fair to say that you take the good and the bad things from all the coaches into your coaching career? You try, you try to take the good uh, but it's, it's difficult because you see the football one way and you you try to okay i take some exercises from this coach the others from the other one the way we we present for opposition goal kicks from other one but it's difficult to take everything from the same coach because you see things uh, probably differently and uh, uh, probably also i would say patrick Vieira was my last coach when we we finished in in the united states he showed me also another way of watching the game more positional football more kind of he came from the from Manchester City Academy so we try to replicate a little bit what they are they were doing with the with the first team and for me it was a little bit different and uh, really good for my for my coaching career now you were captain you took penalties and you took free kicks you obviously didn't let anybody get hold of the ball um, how important are all those roles to you now in head coaching? It's not like the first person who gets the ball takes the free kick. It's all got to be orchestrated. Yes, it has to be orchestrated. At the end, uh, there is a part where players have to make the decisions. If you don't feel confident enough, OK, it's probably a good decision not to take the penalty. But it's not OK. Whoever comes and takes the... No, no, there has to be a previous consensus, a, a order, and then... At the end, it's the player who takes the decision. Even if you say, okay, if there is a penalty, I don't know, whoever has to take it. If you don't feel confident, probably it's the best option to leave it for the second one. But it has to be in some kind of logic, some kind of order. And uh, I think in almost all the teams, I think it will be like this. And the captaincy is obviously a, a vital role as well that you know you were in and you, you're choosing a captain here as well. Yes, for me, it was big responsibility because also Athletic Club is not like any other club. It's very, his philosophy, we only play with Basque players or players that have been uh, playing there in, the, in their youth career. And uh, you feel a little bit of the pressure of, of everyone. You know? It's not that just the, the captain of your team, you represent your players. No, you represent a lot of things. You represent a lot of people. And uh, I felt this responsibility when I was when I was playing for them, and I think it's something that is valuable. And and now I can understand better probably the the players in that I have. 
Now, you may have thought that you were going to finish your career in Spain, but you ended up moving to America with New York City and playing in the MLS. How did that all come about? It was my decision. I think I had the, the chance to continue playing for Athletic Club, but I started feeling that uh, I had been very, very important for the club for a lot of seasons. And a moment arrived when you start feeling, OK, probably I'm not going to continue as a starter every week. Probably I will have to get used to be on the bench sometimes. Probably I can become a problem for the club. And before everything, th these things happen, I think I took the decisions to finish in another in another place, completely different, completely different uh, experience, completely different pressure. Because uh, uh, when I played for Athletic, I felt really the pressure. And when I moved to, to the United States, to New York City, it was something completely different. What did you make of that experience, you know, playing out there, living out there? And, and what do you make of what it's become now? Yes, it's for me a different experience because when I arrived there, it was the first year of the franchise. It was a new franchise. I arrived uh, halfway on the season. We were, I don't know, the two, three last in the standings because it's normal when you start a new franchise, new players. But there's no relegation there, so there's no pressure. It doesn't matter. Sometimes it's strange because it doesn't matter to lose, you know, because when you have no option to play the playoffs, the first months until the end of the first season there were a little bit strange for me because uh, it was completely different sensation. It has to matter to win, to lose. But second season there was much better. We were much better from the beginning. Uh, we had another coach. And we, I think we, we finished second in the standings and even if we lost in the, in the playoffs, it was much nicer. And uh, for me, it was a completely different perspective. Now in, in, in Bilbao, obviously everyone knew us, Athletic Club is everything there. And in New York, almost anyone could recognize you, but not even me. I was playing with the Villa, with Pirlo, with Frank Lampard. And almost anyone recognizes the, these players uh, when you are in living in New York. So I think it's a really nice sensation, especially for, for these kind of players. Now, you also played internationally. Everyone says it's such an honor to represent your country. For you as a head coach now, when players are going away on international duty, is there a little thought in the back of your head thinking, I hope they're going to come back fit and ready to play for my team? <laughs> Yes, at the end, uh, this is always the divide, you know, uh, the clubs are the ones paying the, the, the money to the players and at the end, uh, when, when it really matters, a lot of times players are thinking more on the on their national team. Okay, football has been like this for a lot of years, I don't think it will change. It may change, it has changed in other sports. We see that NBA players, for example, sometimes are not allowed to represent their national teams. I see football far from this position. I still think that these national teams are something big in, in football and we have to, to adapt. We have to try to work the, the best way with the, with the national team coaches. So at the end, it's, it's better for, for everyone and we'll continue to, to do it like this. And I hope we have more players involved that, because it means that we are doing the right things. You retired then in November 2016. When you look back across your playing career, what are the, the highlights and the moments that stick out for you? Uh, probably my, 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 first, my first game, my last game, both in the same stadium, in San Mames. Uh, the best memories probably were there because the sensation we have when, when you made your debut. I remember it was against uh, Barca, first game of the season. I was starting... Uh, the, the the nerves you have there before the, the game, you remember. And after a lot of years living the way I did with all the the, the people uh, that uh, really thanked me and, and, and it was a very good sensation, probably are my, my, my best memories. Was moving into coaching a natural transition for you? Uh, I think it's something that I didn't have clear. But I wanted to give it a try. Let's say I, I, I told my friends, I want to, to prove myself. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I didn't have very clear that I want to become because 
I know that it's not easy. The life of a coach is not easy to 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 be in charge of so many people with the pressure, uh, sometimes with the loneliness of a coach. It's not easy, but I it's the 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 thing we control more. I think we we all want to try new things. The way we see the game, try if it works, and it was my my first thinking. Okay. Uh, let's take all the courses. Let's take the everything. Let's learn. Let's prepare, and then w- let's try. Now you had a good grounding in Cyprus with Larnica and then Miranda's I- I- in Spain. Just tell us about those two positions there. Yes, probably were mm, the first options I had. I, I didn't think too much. Okay, because I wanted to try to prove myself. Let's see if I see myself in this position. And were really helpful experiences in Cyprus. Also, it helped me with the language because there, I had to coach in English. That has become a very good thing for for moments like today. And uh, also in Mirandes was my first experience. Let's say in a in a big league or it was second division, but in Spain it's a strong league. Uh, we were uh, recently promoted, so uh, it was kind of this is gonna be yes or no. And it was a good season, and I think uh, the, I had very, very good friends, both sides, both both places, and I'm willing to return always to these places. You have spoken about the coaches that you played under. Tell us about the the best advice that you were given by them. I think the best advice is, um, you know, you have to make the mistakes, and you have to. S- feel for yourself and you have to experiment and you have to the only way to progress in your coaching career is making the mistakes because next time you will think okay we're in a in the same position we took this decision probably was not the best and you have to learn quickly because this the game doesn't wait for anyone and the only way is 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 doing and putting in practice everything you even if you read you follow all the best coaches you follow everything you have a lot of information right now but i think you have to make your own mistakes and be quick to learn from them is it true you're a, a big admirer of german football yes yes i've always been because the way they play i think it fits very well with the way I understand the game, I think they are normally uh, they prioritize the the collective idea. They try to play in a high rhythm. The pressing normally is is good. Every player is quite uh, complete. You know, it's offensively, defensively, set pieces, and this this philosophy is the one that I think it fits better with the way I I, I see the game. Now, after leaving Miranda's. You remained in the Spanish second tier with Rayo Vallecano. For those people in England listening, tell us a little bit about Rayo Vallecano and the club. Yeah, Rayo Vallecano is a very special club also. I think it uh, doesn't have a, the structure probably that the big teams in Spain have. Also, the stadium is special. It's in the in the middle of uh, Vallecas neighborhood. The atmosphere there is really nice. It's a stadium with only three stands. Three stands, yes, but it's... It's uh, really, uh, everyone likes to play there because their supporters are are really good all the time singing with the team. And I felt uh, probably after the first season there where it was when we had kind of the pressure because it was second division, uh, we had the pressure at least to play the playoffs, to finish top six. We did it, we managed to, to get the promotion and then the two seasons we played there in first division were kind of no so much pressure and we 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 had good players. The, 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 almost the, the same players we received in the, the first day in second division were the ones we've left because they've, they've performed really well. Now, that promotion that you were talking about just then, what an incredible achievement for you relatively early on in your coaching career. Just tell us a little bit more about that season and and you must have really enjoyed it. Yes, I think it's something that a lot of coaches that uh, have more trophies, you know, it's they, they talk a lot about this. It's Winning a trophy is a lot, but promoting from second division to first division is something big because it really changes a lot of things in the club. 
and uh, to 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 also in the playoffs i feel that is more probably more unexpected because when you are i don't know you are first second of the season you kind of see that okay it's coming and probably we're gonna promote playoffs is okay it's not like exactly like here we play uh, two legs you know so it's a little bit different but we all we we lost first game at home against Girona and then we had to go there and win by two goals and we did it we we finished nil two winning the game and probably it's the best achievement I've 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 done as a coach you've been quoted as saying I prefer too much chaos to too much organization can you expand on that for us as, as a I don't know as a football uh, viewer or if I'm in the stands you know I, I need things to happen in a game no and also as a coach I think uh, the way we see the the game I think we can take more things when when there are more attacks, more spaces, more uh, more things happening close to the boxes than when everything is too controlled. You know, it's, I feel like overall Premier League is like this. You go and see Italian teams that probably is the, are the same level, but are completely different. They don't leave spaces, they close everything, they keep control of the game, even they, okay, they slow it a little bit. Uh, with the ball and it's different and I feel like uh, Premier League every other team no, I wouldn't say every other team but a lot of teams try to be more direct more even if they okay we all have uh, and, uh, the, our structure our organized attacks our uh, whatever you do the 3 plus 2 the 2 plus 3 whatever you want to do in the build up but uh, they don't spend so much time during the, the build up I read somewhere that you don't park the bus as a head coach; you take it for a ride. <laughs> but it's not—it's not like a, a lot of times they say this. Like oh, he's very offensive. No, it's because I think is the way the best way to defend. I'm not—I'm not safe when I feel we are very close to our goal, and even if we have the players in our box, I don't feel safe when I'm coaching out there. I—I I always feel we are in danger. And I feel safer if we, even if we are higher and we have a space, but the ball is farther from our goal. We have to be ready to come back. We we have to be ready to manage our our line, our defensive line. We have to put pressure to manage these things. But it's the way I feel as a coach. I if I felt that uh, being in a low block, we would be able not to concede. I would be okay with this. But I feel. That it's, I, I don't feel well like this. I read, read a very good article written by Sid Lowe uh, recently, and people who played under you and know you described you as brave, clear, and introverted. Is that fair? Yes, I would say that probably there are worse things to say about me, but I wouldn't tell you. I wouldn't tell you. But uh, yes, I think the players demand a clear information. A lot of uh, a lot of places you can you can read now. Players demand freedom to do whatever they want and demand a little bit of leaving decisions open. And okay, there are some decisions, especially on the ball, that they have to take. We can help them, but especially without the ball, I think players demand very clear information: what we are going to do when the ball is here, what we are going to do when the ball is here. And I think it's the the help we can we can provide them. And apparently there is no smoke selling with you. No, you you don't. You say it as it is. I try, I try, because uh, players are really smart. And when you talk to a player, he smells and he he can see and he can. Every time you talk to a team, they are examining you. You know, you are. They are analyzing what you say, everything you say. And I prefer to be really honest, even if I, I'm giving them or I putting them in a worse positions that probably they are. So later in the season, they cannot tell me, okay, no, you promised me I was going to play, I was going to be very important. No, no, I told you the competition was this, you have to earn your spot, you have to earn your minutes. And then if everything goes well and this player plays a lot, he will be always grateful. 
he doesn't, okay, we talked about this, and I think it's better to clarify these things as soon as we can. Sometimes you cannot tell a player because you really don't know if he will play or not, but it's you have to tell him as, as, as it is. You use the word smart there. Now, do you think that players are getting smarter all the time and do they have to be smarter? They are and they have to be because probably when we used to play not so many years ago, we weren't so aware about opposition, about tactics, about other players we were facing. And now they have all the information. Coaches are also, every coach is, uh, has his education, his uh, degrees, his experience, and uh, players take everything. They are they, they they are the ones that take all the information from one coach, from the other, from the opposing team, and sometimes are the ones that provide better solutions. A lot of times in half times, uh, I, I like to listen to them. Okay, we are having this travel. How do you see it? How do you see the solution? At the end, coaches we have to take the 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 last word. We have to take the 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 best solution for us. But I think it's good that we we listen to them. There was a feature on Sky Sports recently about the future of football and you said that systems and structures had become a lot more dynamic. How would you describe your footballing philosophy? Yeah, I said this because we demand a lot more from players. Some years ago, probably you could play with a number 10 who didn't defend. Yes didn't defend and okay it was good because he was good on the ball and you could survive defensively with one or two players less and you leave number 10 number nine wingers not following but yeah you cannot allow this so uh, players have to uh, evolve have to become okay now with the ball we're gonna do this you are gonna be more in the inside without the ball you have to follow this player but you have to change you have to jump here from here to here when we are ready to to press this way and they have to understand everything so they can perform the best way so last season the barcelona boss chavi called a uh, called rayo valacano the biggest pain in the arse in the liga that must be a big compliment <laughs> Yes, I took it as a compliment. I took it as a compliment. I think we've been, I don't know if lucky, I think we, we deserved good results. I, I don't know if so good results that we took against them last last games. We played the uh, uh, past two seasons, but I think we we were uncomfortable for them because we, we didn't leave them so much time to take their structures, to, to make their positional play. And I think they... There, there is always luck, you know, when you win against these teams, you, you have to be lucky, you have to take the chance you have, you have to, but I think we did a lot of things against them very well. Now, you've already spoken about the lure of the Premier League and how excited you are for the first game this weekend against West Ham. What can AFC Bournemouth supporters expect to see across the course of the season from their team? I hope, uh, we always, the coaches say the same, we hope they are proud of the players. Uh, I think we are in hands of the players. They are the most important thing and we have to support them. Uh, we have to help them. I have to help them, especially the coach. But they are the ones that will will give us the, the results, the, the, the good moments of football. And uh, I think we have uh, very clear the way we want to play. I don't know. It will get us results or not, you never know. You never know when once we start the season. But I feel pretty confident after the, the pre-season. Uh, we'll have now some, some the first three, four weeks until the market closes. That will be a little bit uh, different because uh, you, you have players that you don't know if they will continue. You will have players that they are not right now here. We every week now waiting, okay, the next opponent is going to sign this player. Is This first week is going to be a little bit different, but I think once the market uh, closes, once we establish a team, I think we, we, we can be a good team. For those supporters that are listening to this podcast, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of them, what is your message to them? No, I felt... Uh, since the, 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 the first moment I arrived and they are behind the team, 
uh, even the press season friendlies for a press season to see all the people that came to watch the games for me was really nice really nice because normally in other stadiums you see that only they use one stand or whatever for a precision game and the games were they were almost full and the, the atmosphere was really nice and I think they will help us especially when we play at home but also away because even when we played against Southampton I, I could hear them all the game and it was really nice for me to see them uh, the, the, this way and unfortunately we could give them a good game and I cannot ask anything for them. I will try to give. We will try to give them a good moments. It's uh, the, the the reason why we we play because we want to give our supporters good moments, and uh, we will we will keep working for this. What sort of research have you done about this club and, and its history? I mean, are you aware that you know not very long ago we were in the bottom division? Yes, I know. I know a lot of things. I I knew before. I, I knew some some people and uh, for me it's really nice it's really nice because you feel okay uh, probably we don't have the the biggest stadium we don't have the biggest history but people here is proud and proud of their history and they say okay we were in third division fourth division we've been there not so long ago now here we are in the Premier League facing the best players in the world in the moment that uh, Premier League is experiencing now because I think probably 20 years ago I wouldn't say was clearly the best league in the world was a big league but there were other big leagues but right now I think it's commonly accepted that uh, uh, we are in the, in the best league in the world Do you see a lot of similarities between here and Rayo? Yes, I see I see a lot of similarities because uh, when you see the uh, yeah, I don't know the the betting for relegation, you know, and you were there third, fourth, you know, and we were like this. The, my two previous seasons with Rai Baikan were exactly the same. We were in the in the red line, you know, and uh, we could have two good seasons when we didn't we didn't uh, suffer, and especially past season we were very very, very close until the last game to play in in Europe. No, I see. Uh, there is kind of similarities in the moment. I think uh, past season was a big achievement for Bournemouth after a promotion. I think next season is, is 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 really important. And now we need to this confirmation that we belong to the division. We are here. We want uh, to to change some things in the way of our how we play the style. But at the end, is okay. We want to confirm that we belong here. Now, I think you did your pro license with Scaloni, who managed Argentina to World Cup glory last year. Does international management take your fancy at some stage down the line? I've never thought. I've never thought on this. I think it's completely different. I was very, very happy for him because I think he's a very smart guy, very nice guy. He was very good when we were in the in the coaching license. He was already uh, working with San Paoli at some point, and uh, we could see from the beginning that he was going to be a really good coach. But uh, I think it's something completely different. I think probably it's something that I could see, or I could uh, maybe it doesn't happen. I think I am more focused in the everyday work. I love the everyday work to come here, see the players, prepare for trainings. A national team, it's something completely different. Has anybody ever told you that you look like Sevi Ballesteros? <laughs> no, they know, they know one. No, and they've told me worse things, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't uh, comment here, but uh, yeah, other similarities. No, no, Sevi Ballesteros. Now, you said you like lots of sports. Do you like golf? I like golf, but I never played. I tried to start, but uh, I, I saw that it was really difficult. I, you have to spend a lot of time learning, so it wasn't worth it. But I followed the game. I followed the game. I, I support John Ram, who is a big athletic club supporter. His grandfather was my, let's say, team manager in athletic club. So I always follow, I support him. I always hope he wins the, the tournaments, but I, I, I don't know how to play. 
Now, you mentioned earlier you're into loads of different sports. We know you're a keen cyclist as well. Just tell us about that and, and where that love of cycling comes from. I've really loved cycling from the beginning. Uh, I think it's something popular, especially in the Basque country. Not only Basque cyclists, but only the, it's normal to go and travel to see Tour de France stages, for example. And I, I really love the, love the sport. And I also like to take my bike and go a couple of hours and uh, stay there thinking in my things, you know. I don't want to push really hard because then you don't have focus and you, you cannot think in other things. But I, I really like to go with my bike and spend two or three hours uh, knowing new places. I don't know if you know, but Simon Francis is a very keen cyclist as well. And he tells us that he goes on 100-mile rides through the new forest. Is that something you fancy joining him on? No, I'm not. I'm not. Simon Francis could still play right now. I think he's much fitter than me. I could just uh, be with him and, 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 and ride for, for some miles, but not for 100 for sure. <laughs> now, what about any other pursuits away from football? I know... NFL, when you were over in America, you picked up an interest for that? Yes, I, I really love a lot of sports. NFL was for me really interesting. I didn't know the sport. I didn't, I hadn't experienced, you know, uh, I went there to watch games in the stadium when I was in New York to see the Giants, to see the, the Jets. And I, I started learning and it's a very tactical sport, very, very tactical. It's almost like continuous set pieces. It was... You, with the blocks, with the uh, spaces, the, the, the different movements, combined movements. And uh, I think it's a really, really interesting game. And I've got to ask you, because it's quite a big topic here in England at the moment, social media, what do you make of it? Some players are on it, some players aren't. It can be good, it can be bad. What, what's your take on it? Uh, I don't have, I don't have any, I don't have Facebook, I don't have, I'm probably I'm the only person, I know that I don't have any, not the... Uh, not on Twitter, not uh, Instagram, not these things, I don't have. But uh, I think they are useful. They're useful because they give you a lot of information. They give you a lot of information. But I personally feel that uh, they are dangerous for us. They are dangerous because uh, it's better not to know everything they say about you. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably uh, you suspect you suspect because of the results, if they say good or bad things, but I, I really haven't started. Probably one day I should start with these things, but it hasn't arrived the, the, the day. I've got 10 quick fire questions for you. You've got to choose one or the other. Okay. <laughs> so the first one, and this is um, Jonathan Woodgate got us talking about this when he did a podcast, because when he was in Spain, he took a fancy to Calamocho. Or sangria, which do you prefer? Calimocho. Calimocho is much more Basque. And uh, I think sangria is for, for holidays. Probably summer holidays, I would go with sangria. The rest of the year, calimocho. Just for anybody listening who doesn't know, calimocho is a mixture of red wine and Coke. Yes, that's it. Yes, yes. Sangria is even more, more mixture. <laughs> Messi or Ronaldo? For me, Messi, no doubt, yes. Madrid or Barcelona as a city? Probably now that I've spent my last three years in Madrid, I would say Madrid. Scoring a goal or keeping a clean sheet? Scoring a goal. I think there's no other sensation than scoring a goal. Madonna or Pavarotti? <laughs> this is a tough one. I wouldn't choose anyone. <laughs> I'm not very. I don't. I, I always say music side. Don't ask me questions about music. I don't know anything about music. You know, I, it's gonna be the toughest. I, I, I wouldn't choose anyone. The Godfather or Titanic? The Godfather. Yeah. Have you got a favorite film out of interest? Is one you always turn to? <sighs> No, I'm not a lot about uh, films also. I think I like the Nolan films. Nolan, I think, makes films that make you think in different things, special things, and I would take those ones. Right, this is a choice of two famous Basque desserts, Gato Basque or Goshua. Goshua, yes, yes, we say yes. I would take both, both, no doubt. I cannot choose. I would take those both, yes. Okay. 
Tour de France or Vuelta a España? Tour de France, yes, for sure. I've got one more music one. You might know a little bit more about Julio Iglesias or Enrique Iglesias. <laughs> I wouldn't choose, but if I have to choose between the two, I go with the father. Fish and chips or paella? Uh, okay, we are playing here at home, I would say fish and chips. <laughs> have you experienced, is it yes. your first experience in England of fish and chips? or No, I, I've been here also in, in different parts of the country, playing on holidays, and uh, I've had fish and chips before. That, uh, but I'm I'm good. I, I eat everything uh, normally. I don't have special problems with the with the food, and I, I really like to experience uh, food from from different places. Now, just to finish off, we've got a few questions that have been submitted by fans that they'd like to ask you. So I'm going to kick off with Marv on Twitter. He's asking, "Who's the best player that you've ever played with?" Uh, in opposite team, Leo Messi for sure. In my team, I would go with. Uh, probably Xavi in the national team Xavi was an amazing midfielder he played he knew what to do before receiving all the time and I would say Xavi Now you sort of answered this one a little bit just a moment ago Andrew's asking how much time had you spent in the UK before you came to work in Bournemouth? I've come a lot to play games or pre-season games or friendlies during the season or in Europe sometimes a couple of times on holidays summer holidays couple of small breaks, a couple of days in different parts of the of the country. But uh, I had never been here in Bournemouth. Morgan wants to know, out of all the places that you've visited in and around Bournemouth so far, do you have a favourite or is it too early to tell? I think it's too early to tell, but I, I could say all the places I've been haven't really, really, really nice. The coast, I, I love the coast because I've, I come also from the Basque country. I, I live in front of the sea and I, I, I love uh, all the, the, the coastal cities. Now, Tate wants to know, what team in the Premier League do you think Bournemouth are most similar to, if any at all? Hmm. Or maybe is that it's giving too much away? <laughs> quest, dif difficult question right now, before we start the season. After some games, probably I would be uh more 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 precise i i wouldn't i wouldn't say right now now the final question is a really good question it's actually one that i would love to ask you as well from sam have you had an english cup of tea yet i am coffee i am coffee guy <laughs> i am a coffee guy i know i have to start with the tea but i am still in the coffee side <laughs> well at some point in the next month i will make you an english cup of tea and you can tell me after that i will appreciate the story <laughs> Now, Andoni, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us. We've really appreciated your time. We, we know how precious, to, precious it is. Thank you very much. Now, if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we would absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, be it AFC Bournemouth related, Spanish football fans, or just the general football fan can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Andonia Raiola and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle, thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast.